Hello everyone. In this final lecture of the course, we would like to discuss a very important and relevant topic uh, in quantum computing and quantum information today, namely the idea of quantum error correction. Having learnt about quantum bits, quantum gates, quantum circuits and quantum algorithms and in particular how they offer us speed up over classical tasks um, in several cases. What remains is to ask what are the key challenges before us today in realizing a physical scalable quantum computing device. And this brings us to the concept of quantum errors as in errors that affect quantum bits and quantum gates and how do we fix them, right? And this is the subject of quantum error correction. Of course, in this one lecture, we will only be able to briefly introduce the subject, but we hope to give you some understanding of what, what we mean by noise affecting quantum systems and what kind of tricks we have at our disposal in order to address the effects of noise. So I always like to begin with this um, favorite quote of mine that quantum phenomena do not occur in a Hilbert space, rather they occur in a laboratory. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we translate all the wonderful um, techniques that we learned over the past uh, few weeks into physical quantum processors. And that brings us to this list of requirements that need to be fulfilled in order to be able to build a robust and scalable quantum computing device. And this list is due to uh, David DiVincenzo, one of the pioneers of quantum information processing and quantum computing. And this was a list that was laid out um, sometime in the 1990s, right? So what does this list say? It says that we need a scalable system with well-defined qubits. We need to have the ability to initialize to a simple fixed state, that we need to ha have the ability to reset all our qubits, right? And typically you would like the ability to reset to say the ket zero, right? The zero bit. Then we come to what will be the topic of this lecture, the key challenge that we will try to discuss in this lecture, namely long decoherence times and I will explain shortly what decoherence means. Of course, the ability to perform a universal set of gates, we have already discussed this and the ability to perform efficient single qubit measurements. And you must have seen over the past few weeks that a lot of these requirements are indeed fulfilled by some of the processors that you have um, had access to on IBM Q. So what is this issue of decoherence, right? Decoherence refers to irretrievable loss of information or to be more technical, the loss of coherence in a quantum system due to interactions with its environment, um, which is also often referred to as the bath, uh, to be more formal, right? So the idea is that the quantum systems that we would like to um, build as qubits are not isolated systems in practice. In theory, we talk about them as if they are isolated systems, as if they only undergo the transformations that we wish them to undergo via unitary operators or gates. But in reality, quantum systems will typically interact with their environment or the surroundings or the bath and this interaction is often going to lead to irretrievable loss of information from the system. The formal way of stating this is that it leads to loss of coherence. For example, I could prepare a state in a coherent superposition of two qubits and we would lose the phase information or we would lose the superposition as the system undergoes interaction with its environment, right? And this um, transformation, unlike a unitary transformation, is not a reversible transformation and hence the word irretrievable that this loss of coherence is not a, does not occur in a reversible way, rather it occurs in a way that cannot be reversed. So, and this of course leads to noise in our qubits. So here's an example of what this noise can do. And this again is something you might have encountered if you had actually tried to run any of the algorithms that we've discussed on an actual processor. So this is the result of a Grover search um, that is performed using the ideal quasim simulator. 
and you all now use the simulators, you know what this is. So, this is the result of a simulation uh, of the Grover algorithm, right. You notice that the uh, solution state for Grover in this case is the 2 qubit state ket01 and of course, you find that the simulator leads you to the solution state with probability 1. But now I will show you what happens when you do an actual run on one of the IBM processors and this is the 5 qubit Lima processor and you find that of course, you no longer get your solution state with the perfect probability 1, rather you now have a certain non-zero probability of getting all the other states. In other words, you now have errors in the final outcome. So, you do have now a non-zero probability of collapsing into one of the other states which is a non-solution state in this case, right, because the ideal simulator tells you that 0, 1 is the solution state. So, this is an example of what noise can do. It can lead, for example, to faulty outcomes uh, for quantum circuits and hence for quantum circuits, uh, for quantum algorithms. Okay, so let us try to understand this idea of noise better and how we can, um, to what extent rather and how we can mitigate the effects of noise. So, how do we deal with this? So, this is from a recent article which I would highly recommend for everyone to read by John Preskill, again one of the pioneers uh, of the field. Um, so, he says that today we are in an era of what is called noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. So, this is often called the NISQ era, right. The idea being that today we actually do not have at our disposal an error free um, robust quantum computing device, nor do we have the number of qubits that we need to be able to run um, a quantum algorithm uh, to the extent that it can show the quantum advantage over a classical algorithm, right. On the other hand, what we have are intermediate scale devices with say 50 to 100 qubits. They are indeed able to perform certain tasks which surpass the abilities of classical computers today. But the key limiting factor today is noise, noise in quantum gates and also decoherence of the qubits and this will indeed limit the effective size of quantum circuits that can be executed reliably. So, given where we are today, how do we know that this is a technology that is going to scale and that is indeed going to realize its potential and the answer comes in the form of quantum error correction. So, this is our basis for thinking that quantum computers are indeed scalable to large devices solving hard problems which is what they are intended to do. Before we step into understanding quantum noise, it is useful to think a little bit about classical uh, processors and the noise that affects classical computers, right. Classical bits are also prone to noise of course, right, but we do not discuss this issue with such vehemence when we talk about classical processors. Uh, and that is for the following reason, right. So, what is the kind of noise that can affect classical bits? As you know, classical bits are in one of two states, either 0 or 1. So, naturally the noise model to think about is a bit flip error, right, that a 0 can get flipped to a 1 and a 1 can get flipped to a 0 and this can occur with some probability p. So, p here denotes the probability of a single bit flip. In the classical error coding literature, this, this is often referred to as the binary symmetric channel. The word channel refers to any such mapping between some set of input qubits or input bits and output bits. And this mapping as you can see is essentially a kind of conditional probability distribution. It says given one there is a certain probability of this going to 0 and a certain probability of this remaining 1. Given 0, there is a certain probability of it, going to zero, of, of it remaining 0 and a certain probability of it becoming 1, getting flipped to 1. So, this is what we call a bit flip error, more technically a binary symmetric channel. Symmetric because the 0 and the 1 flip to each other with equal probabilities, right. So, how does the classical system deal with this kind of noise, right? And the solution is a rather intuitive that instead of sending a single bit, you introduce redundancy. 
technically you would say that you encode right so classically what we do is what is called the three bit repetition code right um, where the idea is to encode a single zero as a string of three zeros and encode a single one as a string of three ones so now if you think about what is the effect of this single bit flip noise right if you have only single bit flip errors then what can happen to your string of three zeros well it can get uh, transformed into either 0 0 1 where the error now occurred on this bit or it can get transformed to 0 1 0 where the uh, error occurred on this bit and it can get transformed to 1 0 0 where the error occurred on this bit similarly 1 1 1 can get transformed to one of these three bit strings why do I only talk about the single bit errors? Well, because the probability of a single bit flip is p and since p is typically assumed to be much, much smaller than 1, we can typically neglect the higher bit errors, right? Because the higher bit errors are going to occur, so a 2 bit error, for example, occurs with probability order p squared and a 3 bit error would occur with probability order p cube. So, the probability of all 3 bits getting flipped is much smaller than the probability of 2 bits getting flipped which indeed is smaller than the probability of a single bit getting flipped. Another underlying assumption here which we will again come uh, dwell upon when we talk about quantum errors is that we are assuming that the noise acts identically and independently on each of the 3 bits and this is often what is referred to as an IID scenario right that the noise is acting is independent and identically distributed so that's why we say that the probability of two bits getting flipped goes as order p squared because each bit gets flipped with the same probability p and these are independent events now, right? So, with this underlying physical assumption that the noise is independent and identically distributed on the bits and therefore, the 2-bit two, two errors are less likely than the 1-bit error and the 3-bit errors are even less likelier than the 2-bit errors and so on, we focus our attention only on the single-bit errors, right? And we find that this simple encoding already helps us resolve the single bit errors, right? So, remember we encode a single 0 as 3 zeros and we encode a single 1 as 3 ones. Under the effect of the noise of the single bit bit flip noise, um, these are the probable output strings, right? After the action of the noise and you find that these are distinct strings, right? These are distinct 3 bit strings and you can now think of a decoder, right? Just as this was the encoding map the 0 going to 0 0 0 and 1 going to 1 1 1 is the encoding. What does the decoder have to do? The decoder has to take these noisy 3 bit strings and map them back to either 0 0 0 or 1 1 1. And how does the decoder decide which one to map to? Well, in this case it is simple as you can see all that the decoder has to do is to do parity checks. A more informal way of saying it is that the decoder simply has to do majority voting, right? So, if the decoder finds that the number of zeros in the 3 bit string is greater than the number of 1s then he or she knows that the, those must be mapped to 0 0 0 and if the number of 1s is greater then it is clear that those kind of strings must be mapped to 1 1 1. So, this is the decoding procedure. Another way of saying it is that the decoder has to check the parity of this 3 bit string. So, that basically tells you whether there is an even number of 1s or an odd number of 1s right and depending on that the decoder can uh, basically map the string back to one of the two uh, correct uh, 3 bit strings that is 0 0 0 or 1 1 1. These correct 3 bit strings are what are called code words. We will revisit this terminology again in the context of quantum error correction and this uh, uh, this idea of encoding a 0 into 3 zeros and 1 into 3 ones is what is called a code, right? And this is the simplest example of a classical code. It is what is called a 3-bit repetition code and as you can see, it does help us 
uh, resolve single bit errors and it helps us map it back to the correct original bit right so once the decoder has mapped back to 000, zero then he or she knows that three zeros represents a single zero and three ones represents a single one and hence the information is decoded and as we just argued it's the two bit and three bit errors which we do not um, detect or correct in this with this code and so we are able to correct errors up to order p squared right so this is the is a very simple example of a classical error correcting code for a very simple classical noise model namely bit flip errors in the classical case we note that um, we can have either bit flip errors or we can have erasures right and these are the two main noise models that we'll have to consider and that we'll have to correct for. Of course, you can have an, the bit flip itself can become asymmetric and so on. But fundamentally, there are these two noise models, the bit flip and the erasure. And now when we come to the quantum case, we'll see that the situation is somewhat different, right? So with this introduction uh, or with this sort of background motivation, we'll now move on to talking about noise in quantum systems. Now, the situation in the quantum case, we have to first understand the origins of noise in the quantum, uh, for on quantum states, right? So, this is a kind of cartoon picture which tries to depict what a quantum noise channel is. So, the idea is that you are starting with some system Hilbert space. Remember that quantum states are vectors in a certain Hilbert space, right? And they are referred to, uh, we denote an arbitrary state as ket psi. Now, how does uh, noise occur and as we mentioned in the very introductory slide the noise occurs because of some interaction with of this isolated system so when I draw this uh, system Hilbert space I think of this as an isolated system right but now when it is interacting with another system which we call the environment typically then this system is no longer isolated Rather, what is now isolated is the complete system plus environment or system plus bath. So, what is this uh, environment that one is talking about? Well, imagine you have your two level atom, right? Imagine a two level atom and this two level atom, remember the ground state is what we call ket 0 and the excited state is what we call ket 1. Now, suppose this were to re reside in a cavity, right? So, this atom in a cavity. Uh, now, the atom can interact with the radiation modes in the cavity. So, the cavity system is typically a system of much larger dimension than this two level atom. The atom is simply a two dimensional quantum system, but the cavity is a system of much higher dimension. And this cavity is what constitutes the environment or the bath in this case, right. Um, you can just think of the environment or the bath as something that arises from uh, a kind of non-zero uh, temperature, right, of your system sort of being in a non-zero temperature and therefore having some unwanted excitations or interactions with its surroundings, right. It's never possible to completely isolate a quantum system. Now, we, uh, when we discussed the postulates, we said that quantum systems evolve according to unitary transformations, right. But that is true only so long as your system is isolated. So, in this case, because the system plus environment, so in this case, the two level atom plus the cavity, together, they constitute an isolated system. We typically say, denote an isolated system like this to say that there are no external influences on this. This isolated system together evolves according to a unitary and that is what this U denotes. So, the U here denotes the unitary uh, evolution of both system plus environment. But now what happens to the system state alone? The system state alone no longer evolves according to a unitary. We need uh, a much more, uh, a, more a slightly more compli uh, complex mathematical framework in order to depict what the system state undergoes when system plus bath together evolves according to a unitary matrix or a unitary transformation. So, we will not get into the mathematical details here. We will simply say that the mapping now of the system state alone, right? So, if I ignore the effects of this environment, 
So the idea is that we do not have control over the environment. Okay, System plus environment together evolves unitarily, but we do not have control over the environment. We would like to understand what happens to the system states alone. It turns out that they evolve according to some map E, right? which is what is often called a quantum channel. We will not get into the mathematical framework of this in this lecture. I will give you some references at the end of the lecture if you would like to learn more. And so we say that the final state of the system starting with psi, it goes to something of the form E acting on psi psi. I hope you all recall this outer product notation. Remember that when I write down this outer product notation, this uh, is basically a projector onto the state psi. Okay, this is what we call a projector onto the state psi. It is simply a, a matrix way of representing the state psi. Right? It is simply a kind of matrix or an operator associated with the state psi and for the purposes of discussing the effects of noise, it is often useful to write in terms of this notation where instead of talking about states, you rather talk about the projectors associated with the states which are represented as operators like this. So now the two takeaways from here are that this evolution now of the system state from psi to some this is what we call some map okay some transformation acting on psi this evolution is not unitary right and therefore this is not reversible remember unitary operators have the property that u dagger u is identity and so u inverse is u dagger itself so we know how to invert the action of a unitary transformation but these are now not invertible transformations and we will discuss this further with a simple example of quantum bit flip noise since we just talked about the classical bit flip error, right? So the quantum bit flip noise one can describe exactly identically to the classical bit flip channel that my system as we know exists in one of two states, uh, can exist now as ket0 or ket1 but of course the quantum bit can also exist in a superposition and that is where we have to now worry about what happens to those superpositions, we will come to that. But just to look at the action on the basis states alone, ket0 can get flipped to ket1 with probability p and ket1 can get flipped to ket0 with probability p. Ket0 remains ket0 and ket1 remains ket1 uh, with a probability 1 minus p. Once again, p is the probability of the qubit state flipping right from 0 to 1. So now recall that this kind of a transformation of ket0 going to ket1 and ket1 going to ket0 is achieved by a certain gate. This is nothing but, if you think about it, this is nothing but a quantum not gate, right, which is nothing but the x gate. And recall that the x gate is represented by the 2 by 2 matrix 0, 1, 1, 0. This is what represents a transformation from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0, right? So this transformation of course is indeed a unitary transformation, it is a quantum gate. So then what are we talking about? Well the point is the state of the qubit does not undergo an X gate all the time. It is not undergoing a bit flip deterministically. Rather the state of the qubit is affected by an x error with probability p and it is left unchanged with probability 1 minus p. So now to talk about the evolution of the system, we can no longer just talk in terms of these kind of pure states and superpositions, rather what we now have is a mixture of two possibilities. It is a to be more technical, it is a stochastic mixture of two possibilities. One that the state of the qubit has indeed undergone an X gate and has become and has, and has undergone a bit flip and this happens with some probability and the second possibility is that the state of the qubit has remained unchanged. So if I now have a zen general superposition of the form alpha 0 plus beta 1 then under the action of the X gate this is going to become alpha 1 plus beta 0 
and this happens with probability p and alpha 0 plus beta 1 remains alpha 0 plus beta 1 with probability 1 minus p. So, we say that the system has started in a pure state. Let us say for example that it does not start in a superposition but rather starts exactly in ket 0. What happens under the action of this noisy evolution or under the action of the bit flip noise is it no longer remains ket 0 nor does it become ket 1 which is what it would become if it were simply uh, the action of an x gate, right. It does not remain ket 0, does not become ket 1, rather it becomes a mixture of 0 and 1. And this is what is often called a mixed state, right. And this process is what is called decoherence. That what was a coherent superposition has become an incoherent mixture, right. So, a pure state of the form ket 0 now decoheres into a mixed state of this form where with probability p you get the 1 state. Remember, like I said, the outer product 1 1 is nothing but uh, it denotes a sort of projection operator on the state ket 1, right. And similarly, the outer product 0 0 denotes a projection on to the ket 0, right. And mathematically, this is the way we denote mixtures as combinations of the projectors on to the corresponding ket state, ket vectors. The ket vectors are our pure states, right. And such um, combinations or incoherent mixtures of the ket vectors are what we call mixed states, right. Okay. So, uh, the idea, uh, I hope the idea of what happens under noisy um, quantum evolution is clear. It is no longer unitary evolution. Um, this often uh, is what is called a quantum channel, right. A quantum channel denotes this kind of non-unitary evolution where a pure state can decohere into a mixed state. And a superposition, coherent superposition becomes an incoherent mixture of two, uh, of different, an incoherent mixture of different pure states. Before we get into um, how we can detect and correct for this kind of noise affecting our quantum bits, uh, it is useful to also understand what this error probability p looks like. So, this error probability p has a physical origin like we explained. It has to do with how the system interacts with its environment or the bath, right. And in particular, it is a function of time. So, the idea is that if I prepare my system in this kind of a coherent superposition state, then with time, the state is not going to remain alpha 0 plus beta 1, rather it is going to slowly decohere. And the p in some sense captures the rate of decoherence and it is a function of time which varies as one, half of 1 minus e to the minus t by capital T. And this capital T is some characteristic time of the system called the coherence time. And this is a term that you will often find used when people talk about the physical realization of qubits. You will find different companies talking about achieving longer coherence times, right. Because you see, uh, when t is 0, right, when t is 0, as we explained, the error probability is actually 0, right. The system which was prepared in a pure state just remains the way it should be, right. But as t starts increasing from 0 to capital T, let us say, which is the coherence time, you find that p of t starts increasing. For very large t, which is t tending to infinity, right, you find that p of t becomes a half. And what happens when p is a half? It means that your the qubit that was prepared in 0 will remain 0 with probability half and will go to 1 with probability half, right. So, that is a kind of maximum noise situation, right, where this the, the incoherent mixture becomes an equally equal mixture of ket 0 and ket 1. What was originally ket, one, ket 0 becomes an equal mixture of ket 0 and ket 1, right. So, somewhere between the 0 and infinity times is this coherence time. And the coherence time tells you the time beyond which the error rate has deteriorated so much or the, the error probability has increased so much that the 
qubit is no longer useful, that the useful information in the qubit has decohered substantially by the time you hit the coherence time. So, a qubit with a longer coherence time can retain coherence, retain information for longer, right. And just to give you an example of where we are today, and this is a slightly dated image already, this is um, from September 2017, an article in, uh, that, that appeared in September 2017 to talk about the current generation of superconducting qubits. And you find that steadily over the past 15 years and now 20 years, these coherence times have been increasing, right. And these are different kinds of superconducting qubits, charge, flux, transmon, 3D transmon, etc. What we have on the y-axis is the coherence time in microseconds, right. And you find that today we are somewhere here, somewhere actually not so much at 1000, but somewhere between 100 to 1000 microseconds, right. So, this is where we are at. We have superconducting qubits which have coherence times of about 100 microseconds. So, what this means is that if you would like to do gate operations on these qubits in such a way that they are done coherently, right, then these gate operations must be done within the coherence time of the qubit within this 100 to 1000 microseconds, right. Okay, um, so this talks about some uh, a kind of coherence time called T2. So, we have described a certain model of quantum error, namely the bit flip channel, the quantum bit flip channel. But before we enter into discussing error correction, first error detection and error correction techniques, we should understand that we cannot simply pick up the sort of techniques that worked for classical bits, right. While we can indeed take inspiration from them, we will have to modify them suitably to address quantum errors. So, what are these challenges? So, firstly, the encoding process, the classical bit could simply be copied multiple times, right. In place of a single 0, you can copy the 0 and make it 3 zeros, 4 zeros, 5 zeros, etc. But as we know, an arbitrary quantum state cannot be copied and this is the content of the no cloning theorem which was discussed in week 2. So, when we talk about introducing redundancy in quantum information processing, it has to be done in a way that circumvents the no cloning theorem. This is the first challenge. The second challenge is the following. In the classical case, we said that there could either be bit flip errors or erasure errors. But in the quantum case, there could be several possible error models. We could have bit flip errors, but equally well you realize we could have phase flip errors. And what are phase flip errors? That instead of the x operator acting on the qubit, you could have the z operator acting on the qubit. So, what this would do? is to take a plus state to a minus state with probability p and the plus state would remain a plus state with probability 1 minus p. So, that is a phase flip error. We could have other kinds of errors called amplitude damping errors. So, in fact, because quantum states live as vectors in Hilbert spaces and not as simply um, field objects like classical bits, Quantum bits are susceptible to a continuum of several possible errors that can occur on a single qubit. So, this is the second challenge that we seem to have multiple noise models. So, how do we build error correcting codes to deal with multiple kinds of noise? And finally, one of the most important challenges is the fact that measurement disturbs a quantum state. We discussed the measurement postulate in week 1 and we said that measurement leads to collapse of the state it actually breaks the superposition and makes the state collapse into one of a set of orthogonal states. So, now how do we detect errors? Because if we are going to measure the qubit, then by the very act of measurement, we are going to destroy the information in the state, we are going to destroy superposition. So, how then do we manage to overcome this and decode quantum information? So, this is what brings us to the beautiful theory of quantum error correction which tells us how all of these challenges can actually be overcome and we do have techniques uh, by which we can encode quantum information, by which we can decode 
and correct for the effect of various kinds of noise affecting qubits. So, I will quickly summarize what these solutions are and we will discuss them in detail in the next segment. The first solution or the first quantum trick that comes handy is entanglement. So, we encode into entangled states, right? And entanglement becomes a natural way of introducing redundancy in the quantum case. And as we will see in the following segment, uh, entanglement provides us a natural way of even overcoming the no cloning theorem when it comes to introducing redundancy. Now, regarding this problem of having a continuum of several possible errors, the same Hilbert space structure also gives us the idea of an error basis. That instead of having to correct for every possible uh, noise model, we simply pick a basic set of errors to correct for. And once we have an error correcting code that corrects for this basic set of errors, then by linearity, if every error can be represented in terms of this error basis, then we correct for all possible errors, we correct for any arbitrary error. So, the the linear vector space structure that underlies quantum theory gives us this useful trick that we can simply discretize our errors in terms of a finite set of unitary errors. And what I mean by unitary error, the example of unitary error would be errors which occur by an x transformation or a y transformation or a z transformation. Finally, how do we deal with the fact that measurement disturbs the state? So, how do we decode? Well, we decode using controlled gate operations. Remember the controlled knot and other controlled unitaries that we have discussed in the first two weeks. So, we make use of these controlled unitary operations to extract the information about the error onto a different qubit, not the qubit that is carrying the information, but onto a different qubit. And we measure this additional qubit or the ancillary qubit and hence decode, right. So, these are the challenges that quantum errors pose and these are the quantum tricks at our disposal that help us fix these quantum errors. So, we look into this in some detail in the next segment where we will dis we'll discuss the, um, the, the quantum bit flip noise in some detail and we will discuss a quantum error correcting code that detects and corrects for such bit flip noise.